We're gonna be here until five o'clock this time, one hour and 15 minutes. And we are gonna talk about lifting periodization for elite discus throwers and, and of course I've been that on what we are doing and, and I'm actually working with uh, four discus throwers right now and uh, they are get that has thrown 73 and and Omar El Ghazari that has thrown 66.58 Mark Israel from Estonia that has thrown 66.56 and uh, Niklas Arrhenius from Sweden has, has thrown 65.77 and they are all pro <coughs> and they come from a very different school of lifting. Niklas is born and raised in USA even though he's Swedish Gert is like coached by me for the last seven years. Matt is an Estonian that comes from a little different coach there and uh, has been in America also. And Omar comes from a system from a doctor in Cairo that has his philosophy from, from former East Germany and is a doctor in throwing from Leipzig since 1970 something and has thrown 20 meters plus in the shot put. So very different schools and also then different programs because I cannot, when these guys come to me, I'm this kind of coach that takes over people that are 20 to 22 years of age, have had some talents before and are on the borderline to even quit or go full time. That's where I come in. <coughs> it has turned into being like that. And I build my theories in lifting on on like the school that I was schooled in in Iceland when I was young and then uh, I went to school in America and learned what they I had very good coaches in America <coughs> actually in in my school years. And then through the years, I worked with a lot of athletes and working with Joachim Olsen and Gerd Kanter at the same time. That was the biggest school for me when it comes to lifting. Then at the same time, I was very lucky to be thro throwing in the 80s and 90s. Because in the 80s and 90s, we did a lot of lifting, a lot of volume, a lot of strength. And we didn't maybe really throw as far as we should have comparing to all the lifting we did. So what these guys are doing today is piece of cake comparing to what I used to do. That doesn't mean that I was doing the right thing. I think I was a little bit doing too much. So if we take like generally what we are trying to do here in lifting is to lift weights to throw far. Uh, in, in, in early days it was more to lift to lift and get strong and we separated it much more from the throwing part than we are maybe doing today, at least I am doing today. <coughs> so we are going to go through this and you're also going to get this. Sean is going to answer you when. And we talked about general preparation before. The first part of our training program that we do in October. Then the lifting part is during four weeks, every year, extremely general, okay? And I really want you to, to think about this because I really think it's important that in the first four weeks we do total general preparation period for <coughs> minimum, for minimum four weeks. <coughs> and I've always done it, uh, and this is all common sense here. Here, up here, I have training forms, training methods, volume intensity, circle training, 3 by 10 to 15 reps, pump with one minute in between. It's just like an old-fashioned circle training, twice a week during four weeks. That's only eight sessions eight to nine sessions during a month, okay? 
We do all the muscle groups. We do abs, shoulders, back, chest, arms, legs, and we just pump it like bodybuilders, okay? We do abs every day, stabilizations, exercises every day, and that is included in our warm-up. We do 40-minute warm-up. We also do that here, and we do all kinds of exercises that stabilize the body, and then we do circle training. <coughs> the training methods are three sets, 10 to 15 reps, rest 30 seconds in between to one minute. Tempo is slow, you just kind of go through this in an easy way. The goal is general fitness, injury prevention, <coughs> and it's made in the general preparation period. That is in October, you know? All this stuff is very, very simple. If we go over here, and you're gonna get this handout, you see all this stuff here? Here you see the legs. We do leg curl, we do leg extension, we do calf raises, we do stiff leg deadlift, and we do adduction. Leg curl is a regular leg curling motion on the, on the bench. Leg extension is the <coughs> leg extension like this. Uh, calf raises is just calf raises. Uh, stiff leg deadlift is very good exercise, it's a very big part of our hamstring exercise. That is where you have the bar here and you bend over like that with half straight legs and it takes really hard on the back of the thighs. It's called stiff leg deadlift. Uh, adduction is specifically done for discus and rotation of shot putting. It is the muscles on the inside of the thighs and we do that by, by doing wide uh, squats like this, or we do it by doing in a cable cross machine like that, or like all kinds of different machines that there are that do the inside of the thighs. Don't forget that. <coughs> so the leg exercises are leg curls, leg extension, calf raises, stiff leg deadlift, and adduction. You know all this stuff but we do it for four weeks without doing any squats, without doing any snatches or cleans or anything during that period. It's extremely important. The body is not ready to do heavy lifting until after three to four weeks of general preparation. Chest exercises is flat bench stumbles and flies, no big bench presses or anything, just pump like a bodybuilder. Arm exercises, bicep curls, close grip, bench press, and tricep press. Just pick some exercise that you just work your arms. It has nothing to do with discus. It's just symmetry in the body in the first four weeks. Back exercises, bent over row. Lat pull, seated in front. Uh, good mornings. Hyperextensions, laying, and kickbacks. That's where we lay on a hyperextension bench and kick the legs backwards, okay? This is for the lower back, down to the hamstrings. <coughs> and then shoulders, military press, press behind neck, dumbbell presses, upright row, and seated bent over. All this is bodybuilding, but it's all the muscle groups. Abs and stabs, that's like abs exercises, rotational and forward, and straight, and then we have like a stabilization program that is all kinds of static exercises where you lay in a static <coughs> position for a minute, and, uh, and the physio does that for me. It's very in today to do stabilization exercises, and I wonder why, because we never did that in the 80s. Now it's Swiss ball, and it's all kinds of exercises of people, people almost, almost forget to lift heavy. Don't get, uh, get carried away with that, because it's a, it is necessary, but it's not gonna take over the heavy lifting. I've been told that in England, or in Great Britain, uh, you lift too much and you get too strong and you can't throw. I don't know because I don't have a clue. But if it is like that, 
you get too big and you forget to throw, then you have to think. Then this period here is extremely important. And uh, because you're going to lift to throw further. If you want to lift to lift and just lift to get strong, then don't throw and just be a powerlifter or Olympic, Olympic weightlifter. But we are not powerlifters, bodybuilders, or Olympic weightlifters. We lift to throw far to get power and speed. That has nothing to do with this period. This is just the first four weeks where you prepare the body and the nervous system to lift heavy. And never, ever go into the weight room and do weight lifting and power lifting in the first week after three, four weeks of rest. Don't do that. I have a terrible experience with it. The tempo is slow, general fitness, injury prevention, general preparation period. That is the most simple thing that I'm going to talk about here. It's very simple, but a lot of times very hard for people to do because of some reason. I think it's because for guys, they want to get strong early. What's the rush, really? It's much easier to get strong than learn technique in a discus. It takes much longer time to throw technically well in a discus than get strong in bench press. It's really easy to get strong in bench press early. But if you get strong in bench press early, you're not going to be able to throw. There's no reason to rush. And that's, that's hard for young people to understand, but I'm 47. I used to be like you guys, the young guys. I hadn't time to, to do this. I know better now because I could never use my strength. Geth is never going to get into the level that I was in strength-wise, but he has thrown seven meters further than I ever did. That's a pretty good example. <coughs> Olympic weightlifting. It was pretty interesting that Don Babbitt said that uh, Reese Hoffa is the best shot putter in the world and he doesn't do Olympic weightlifting. That means that every ro road is possible. <coughs> Olympic weightlifting is, the competition Olympic weightlifting is clean, clean and jerk and snatch. What we use in Gert Cantor's program and in my programs is those exercises. We do snatch and snatch pull. We do clean and we do clean pull and we do jerk and we do push press. These are the basic exercises in Olympic weightlifting that all my athletes do. Get does not do snatch, and he does not do jerks. Some of my athletes do jerks, others do push presses. What I mostly use with Get is clean pull, you know, snatch pull, clean pull, clean, and push press. There is a reason for that. He's a very bad snatcher, and I'm a little bit worried about his shoulders when it comes to lifting because his his way of lifting snatch is not very good, and we didn't succeed of getting that much better. So I took it out. <coughs> he likes to clean better, so we do a lot of power cleans. And, and then he was not a very good guy when we started to do jerks. Uh, so we started doing push press, and that worked much better. That's just imps. Why? Because if we take what I call muscle lab training that comes from uh, some scientist called Bosco. He says, if you want to get explosive and fast, work one to four sets, one to four reps, between 75 to 90% of max. One to four sets, one to four reps, before, between 75 to 90% of max, approximately somewhere there. We try to keep Olympic weightlifting within that range. Okay, that means that we are always moving the bar fast. Okay, then I regulate the volume and intensity. So the tempo here is fast or even max, sub-maximal during maintenance periods and maximum during camp periods. Intensity stays between 75 and 100%, but the only time you go up to 100% is the training camps in South Africa and San Diego. In January, and in May, it's the only time you go up to 100% of max. 
That can be a three, three uh, rep max or a one rep max or a two rep max. <coughs> so that's the only time. During the season, as I talked to you about earlier, we stay around 82 to 92 percent of max. Okay? Rest is minimum four to six minutes. <coughs> and the same Bosco scientist has said <coughs> they have to rest minimum six minutes to, to be able to get the speed as good as possible. I don't know about that, but we are staying within four to six minutes. So when you are doing Olympic weightlifting, it's not like the general preparation period where you're actually <laughs> supposed to sweat pretty much, go from one exercise to another, have one minute or even 30 seconds in between. <coughs> Here you do three repetitions, you sit down and you rest, walk around for four to six minutes and then you do another set. That means that the speed on the bar is always maximum. And that's what Olympic weightlifting is all around. We are trying to get as much speed on the bar all year around so we get some speed work in the weight room from our power lifting that we get from squats, deadlifts and bench press and stuff like that. The goal of this, <coughs> of this uh, Olympic weightlifting is strength, explosiveness and speed. It's made all year around except in general preparation, that is in October. We do no Olympic weightlifting and only pools in hypertrophy period. And hypertrophy period was the period in November and December. We don't, no, we not, we don't do single cleans or snatches until January. We start doing that in South Africa in January. Why? There's a very simple reason for that. I'm sparing the body. Cleans and snatches are extremely hard on the body, as Don Babbitt said here earlier. So Reese is not even doing it. So what do I do? I build up the body in general preparation in October. I build up the body in hypertrophy period from November to December by doing a lot of repetitions in squats, in deadlifts, in bench presses and re related exercises like a lot of volume. During that period, we only do pulls, okay? That means that periodization in, is like that, that in October, zero. We don't do anything. In November and December, we do three to five sets of three to five reps of 120 to 130 percent of what you can clean, <coughs> five by five, or five, four, three, four, five, when it comes to reps. So this is total of 25 reps, and this is total of uh, 22 reps, approximately. <coughs> we do even pyramids, or regular five by five, on 120 to 130. That means that if you can clean 160 kilos, you go up 20% more, and let's say that you can clean 160 kilos for four. Then we do four reps on 120% of that. That means that you're sparing the knees on the eccentrical part because when you do cleans and snatches during the period where you're doing up to 10 reps in squats, it's going to totally kill your body. Remember that. We are doing heavy squats, we are doing heavy deadlifts on a lot of reps. The body is slow. The body is big. Okay? During that period, we don't do cleans and snatches. It's one of the keys to stay healthy and build up pure strength during November and December so you can hold later when you start to do cleans and snatches later on. Okay? That means that in January, we do three to five sets of one to four reps, 80 to 100 percent, three by three, or three, two, one, one, and we keep on doing pulls. Now I'm talking here about Olympic weightlifting, <coughs> but not about pulls, because the only time I'm talking about pulls is this. We keep doing pulls all, all year. Ooh, why? Because we have a lot of weight on the bar, we are moving it fast, with more weight than you can clean and snatch, what does that mean? You're only using fast muscle fibers. 
on very heavy weight without catching it. That means you get extremely good base to stand on. It's one of the secrets behind the success of my athletes. It's clean pulls and snatch pulls. Write that down because it's very important. If you do cleans and snatches and you always work on the weight that you can work on, you're going to hurt your back. Why? Because you don't know what overload is. You have never gone on heavier weights. Let's say that you're going to do 160 kilos for three in a clean. <coughs> and you have not gone on heavier weights, not in deadlift or not in, in pulls. Then the pressure on the body, when you catch the clean here, is so hard that it's just a question about time when this is going to give away. And you're not going to get that only by doing stabilization exercises on Swiss ball. Believe me, you're not. So what are we going to do? We can do pulls on 20% more, or even 10% on youngsters that are starting to lift around maybe 17, 18 years of age. Do clean pulls and snatch pulls. That's okay if you need. Is that not clear? Okay. Snatch, pull, like that. No, you don't catch it. Just drop. Yeah. And then clean pulls, boop, up to the toes, up to the traps, using the back, using the legs on 20% more than you can do cleans. That's going to build up your back. And for the most part, you're going to be very strong in the back and then in the hamstrings because you're working on heavier weight than you can do in cleans and snatches. I'm tired of all people that have back problems in throwing. One of the reasons is that they're not doing the exercises they need to do to be brutally strong in the hamstrings and in the lower back. You're going to be brutally strong if you do pulls. Believe me, I know. I'm getting so old. <laughs> okay? So you see the periodization here. We go in February and March, we come home from South Africa, then we, do in, we keep on doing pulls during this period here, on this percent approximately, we just regulate the volume and intensity, uh, <coughs> and we go down to 80 to 90 percent instead of 80 to 100 percent, and we do more sets, more volume when we go home, and we keep on working cleans and snatches, but with more emphasis on pulls. April and May, we go back on a camp, and what happens? Same stuff as we did in January. Again, up to 100%, 3 by 3 or 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 1 in reps. And that means that we are staying within this range. So we do twice during the year where we go up. More up here, and that is the last time we go up. During the season, Olympic weightlifting is done three to five sets, one to three repetitions between 82 and a half and 92 and a half percent of max, three by three or one, 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 one. Very typical exercise for Gert in the summertime is he does five times one in the cleans with six minutes in between on 165 kilos. That is pretty much 90% of what his best is. And then he asks me, I want to do 175. And I know he can. And then I ask him now, and, and he answers the right way. I know what you're going to answer. <laughs> he says to me, I don't need it, because it's only going to fuck up my technique. <laughs> and it does. <laughs> it does. because. I take an example on Joachim Olsen, and Gert, you can, you remember this. <laughs> I was with Joachim in South Africa in 2005. He was in his lifetime shape to 2150 in practice, by far his best ever. He goes to Madrid straight from South Africa, competes two days later uh, through 1976 and stayed in one throw 
in the circle, fouled all of his throws except one. And I saw it on TV and I knew what it was because a couple of days earlier he had come to me and said, coach, I know that you don't like this, but before I go from South Africa, I have to do one thing. And that is to do 200 kilos in power clean. Okay, Joachim, why do you have to do that? I just have to do it. <laughs> okay, uh, and his best was 195. Okay, and I say, it's gonna screw you up in this meat that you're gonna throw in Madrid, I don't care. I have to do it. And if you're not gonna allow me to do it, I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> and then I said, okay, let's do it. It's not gonna affect you in the European Championships in two weeks, because if you do it once, it's okay. But the thing was that Joachim, he missed it. He did it again, he missed it again. He did it again, he missed it again. And I said, stop, no. He did it again, he missed it again. So five times he tried to do 200 kilos. It took him from 2150 down to 1976. He didn't have a clue about how to throw the shot. The week after he was a European champion and threw 2120. That's a typical example why I say no when it comes to lifting extremely heavy right before many times. It's okay if you do one or a couple of sets, but if you do many sets, it's gonna smash your technique, the fine tune. Now that's the reason Olympic weightlifting is not that it's gonna screw you mostly up, it's more the other heavy lifts. Olympic weightlifting is neuromuscular, so you actually you can <coughs> say, why can't I just lift 100% all the time? You can actually do that. I had a long discussion with Adam Nelson about this, and he said, <coughs> When I was young, I used to just get crazy in the weight room and stuff like that. And I can out squat anybody and this kind of stuff. And, uh, but now I'm actually not doing that anymore, even though I can. And I'm a much better shot putter. So what's the difference, I ask. And he says, the difference is that I'm not a weightlifter or a powerlifter, I'm a shot putter. And I can out squat anybody. I can do 650 pounds in squats when I want to, you know? That's 300 kilos. And he has actually done that for many reps, you know? But I don't need to because I can't use it. And I can actually not use it at all if I do it too close to competitions. And that's the reason for that we do in Olympic weightlifting, I don't take any chances with my athletes. I want a long time after they max out in the middle of May until they throw their maximum when it comes to being a discus thrower at maximum level. <coughs> they can throw 70 meters in San Diego early because of good conditions in America and because they are brutally strong. They are throwing on brutality but not on finesse. But during the competition period, and Gert usually has 27 to 30 competitions, actually competes a lot. That means that he cannot be in the weight room all the time like we are in the spring. He cannot train as much. So he's a much better discus thrower at the end of August than he is in May. Even though he's a little smaller, he's faster, he's more explosive. After work on sub-maximal maximal, uh, percent on Olympic lifting from middle of May until middle of August, he peaks every single time physically on that program. And that's actually the truth. It's nothing that I <coughs> say just to feel good about myself. It's actually th the truth from his behalf also. So when it comes to Olympic weightlifting, remember, do no Olympic weightlifting the first four weeks. Do a lot of pulls related to <coughs> cleans and snatches, a lot of, a lot of presses instead of push presses in uh, November and December. Use cleans and snatches in periods when you go on camps, when you want to blast it up and get the intensity up, then it's really fun to do cleans and snatches. When you come home in February and March, go more back to pools, keep on working, because you cannot uh, psych yourself up at the same time as you do in camps at home. It's hard. If you have done PRs in, in uh, 
in uh, camps. It's very hard to do when you come home. <coughs> so rather do more pulls when you get home again in February and March. Then you go on camp again, and then you can do it again. And during June to September, you actually just stay within the percent of what I say here. And I calculate that out for every single set. It works. During the summer, you get to be a better discus thrower. And that means that you're using the power that you build up during the winter, because we build up uh, general preparation, hypertrophy, strength and power, maintenance and a little hypertrophy again, strength and power. And here we are brutally strong. And then we try <coughs> between 8 to 12 weeks it takes to throw the furthest as during the summer by doing three to five sets on one to three reps on Olympic weightlifting on 82 to 92 percent of max. Then I'm saying if somebody mentally needs to go in and do a PR in the snatch <coughs> in the middle of the summer, I'm not going to say no if it happens to be once or twice. But if it's going to be five or six sets, a couple of, a couple of days before a meet, I'm absolutely going to say no. Joachim is a little bit like American way of doing it, and that is more brutal than European way. We are more like finesse. The Americans are more strength related. <laughs> and uh, I'm not saying anything bad about that. It's just a different approach. I'm somewhere in between because I'm a European that is actually <coughs> went to school in America. So, so uh, I, I try to land somewhere in between. Any questions about this? Do you play the, the warm-up before those sets or is it straight into the... No, the, the warm-up is the same here. <coughs> we warm up uh, like we always throw in the morning and then we warm up 40 minutes. In the afternoon, he gets on a bike for 15 to 20 minutes <coughs> and warm up, warms up and then he does these sets are only the sets that are calculated out. We do minimum three to four sets before those sets. So when we do uh, cleans and snatches and pulls and stuff like that, it's always built up with a 20 kilo interval. 60, 80, 100, 120, 140, and then 10 kilos. So this is just the actual calculated sets. Okay, so actually the total volume is twice as much. Relationship with uh, squatting? <laughs> Relationship with squatting? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going into that now. Okay. Power. We do Olympic weightlifting <coughs> in the weekly program on Monday and Thursday in combination with one powerlifting. The combination is like <coughs> that we do, you saw that on the other sheet of paper that I gave to you, how the pairing is. I vary that a little bit, but the pairing is that when we are at home, like in the period that we have been now, is that we do Olympic weightlifting with squats, <coughs> uh, like pools with squats on Monday and uh, on Thursday, with 72 hours in between. And then on Tuesday and Friday, we do uh, bench presses with shoulders. That's the pairing in November and December. The pairing on camps is always the same. And that's on the sheet that you got this morning. The pairing is always that the Olympic weightlifting or the cleans and snatches is done with bench press and the push presses is done with squats. There's a reason for that. It's variation. One of the biggest uh, things in the training um, theory is that you have to have ad you adapt to something and then you have to vary it. So when we go on camps, I vary the pairing of the exercises. Because we are lifting four times a week when we, are, when we are at home. And then we are lifting every day on the 3-1 cycle on the camps. And then we pair it differently on the camps than when we are at home. Okay? 
Then the pairing during the competition period is the same as on camps. <coughs> Always Olympic weightlifting with bench press because it's totally different muscle groups and that means that you can actually uh, get very fresh in both exercises. But then during when we are working at home, <coughs> I try to relate the pulls through the back to the squat because it's related muscle groups. And that is more when we are doing the volume work. Okay? <coughs> Questions? Okay. Then we go on. Power lifting. Powerlifting is squats, bench press and deadlift. <coughs> with the squats we do front squats, with the bench press we do incline bench press, with the deadlift we do sumo deadlift or snatch deadlift. <coughs> I built this on experience. <coughs> Excuse me. Why aren't we doing one leg squats? Why aren't all throwers, like javelin throwers, just doing one leg squats? <coughs> Why are we doing two leg squats? <coughs> yeah, in the delivery phase, but we are also doing a lot on one leg. In the, in the start, we are on one leg when we come here. We are on one leg when we land here, and then the left leg. Javelin throwers are on, on uh, one leg very much. <coughs> it's only tradition that says that we are doing <coughs> two leg squats. So a new generation of coaches do one leg squats, much more than you have been doing in the past. I'm in between. I'm doing a lot of traditional two leg squats because it has worked, okay? And I happen to have athletes that really like it. But I'm actually very much into trying to break, <coughs> break the ice for new generation of coaches and look much more into half squats with overload because you actually recruit much more your motor units in the muscles if you do one leg squats and half squats. But my athletes have tried it and they hate it. <laughs> so what can I do? Mental approach. So there we go away really from theoretical point of view to a mental point of view. And it's important. And then I am actually very important. I work with the athletes that I work with because they are between 21 and 31 years of age. They are no youngsters. They come to me when they are on the doorstep to take the step to being elite athletes or make a career doing something else. That's where I come in. Then they have some kind of belief in <coughs> what works for them. And I work, as I have a degree in psychology, I work extremely much from what they believe in. Then because I'm not, I'm a pretty theoretical guy at the same time as I have a lot of experience because I happen to live at the right time to be a young discus thrower, I think. I was very lucky to be up in the 80s when those guys were really good. And I learned a lot from them and then I'm pretty good on common sense then I can put together a mixture that works theoretically in relation to what the athlete believes in. It's very important. And because of that, Gerd Cantor, he believes in front squats and back squats because we have been very, very successful with it. We don't do any half squats and we don't <coughs> do any one leg squats. It's against my theoretical point of view, but the theoretical point of view is only the one third of the whole system. It's also common sense and experience. <coughs> My experience with squats is that throwers like, like, they like to do squats for the most part. They like to be big in the legs and they like to feel the tone in the legs, at least guys. 
let them feel like that. But if it gets out of hand and it gets too big, it's not to any use. So we are not trying to get as big as possible. We are just trying to get as powerful as possible. And by doing that, you can do that with jumping, we can do it with plyometrics, we can do it with one leg squats, half squats on 135 or on eccentric squats early in the, in the program. And I've done all this stuff, but for what I'm working mostly with now is back squats and front squats. Like I said before, we are doing that in November and December in relation to pulls, and then on camps we are doing squats in relation to push presses, okay, always. And then the training methods are, we never do more than five sets. We are mostly working four to five sets, except during competition. Uh, and reps are one to 10, depending on where we, when we are doing it. We try to do as fast and even max tempo, even though it's very heavy weights, and we are trying to do our best to move the bar as fast as possible. And even though it's going pretty slow because we have 250 kilos on the bar, you are actually moving it as fast as you can. That means that you're using the fast fibers. <coughs> Very seldom, and only once a year, we go up to 100%, and we never take a single repetition on 100% in bench press, deadlift, or squats. We always do a maximum of three because of injury prevention. So we actually never max out in a, in a single repetition. How can I calculate the max then? Just take 92.5% because 92.5% is approximately what is three reps, okay? The rest here, when it comes to the, the power lifting, is two to six minutes in between sets. And the newest uh, theory about hypertrophy, like the November, December training is even only one minute rest if you wanna get big. We are not very much in getting big because we are big enough right now. And the goal this year is not to get bigger. Being 125 to 128 kilos, because it got a little bit bigger last year, keep that weight for 12 more months, then he's gonna be hand handling that weight much better in the circle. It got bigger last year, almost too big. If he gets 12 more months on the same size and the same strength, what's going to happen? It's like a, if Fred Schumacher comes to you, knocks on the door and says, you want to try my car? <laughs> and you're driving like an old Fiat. And he comes with his Formula One car, his Ferrari. And he asks you, what's your name? You. <coughs> huh? Sam. Yeah, he comes to Sam's door, knocks on the and you get totally shocked, man. I'm gonna be able to drive a Ferrari. I, I, you're, you're driving like a Fiat 127 that you got borrowed from your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> With 127 horsepowers, and then Schumacher comes to your house, invites you to his Ferrari, and you go out and drive. How are you gonna do? Well. You gonna do well? No. no. Why? No. You can't handle the power. You cannot handle the power. So what's the difference between that and if you would just put a lot of horsepower in your body? How are you gonna handle that power if you just keep on putting more power in the body? Gert got much more power in the body last year because he was healthy all year. In 2005, and he was not, no, in 2006, he was not totally healthy. A little problem in the back. So he was a little bit smaller than I wanted him to be and we could not do exactly like we wanted to do in the lifting part. Then we were really healthy in 2007. He got bigger and stronger and he reached all his goals in the weight room even though they were just five to 10 kilos more than he had ever done before. But he did that. That means he got bigger, he got stronger and he threw pretty much the same, 72 <coughs> meters. And he was a world champion and he threw six meters over 70 meters. We decided for this year, we stay the same weight and we stay with the same strength level to get 12 more months on the same horsepower. What does that mean? 10,000 more throws 
on the same horsepower, you get to train 10,000 times with Schumacher on the same horsepower instead of once. Are you going to be better? Absolutely. On what? Driving the car. Throwing the discus. Simple. Periodization of powerlifting is very different from Olympic weightlifting. In October, zero powerlifting, November and December, five sets, four to 10 reps, 65 to 90% of max within this range. This is a pyramid, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. A lot of reps. How much is this? 40 reps totally, or 87654. What did we talk about here early? We talked about, we did squats and front squats. We do squats with snatch pulls on Mondays. We do front squats with clean pulls on Thursdays, okay? Then on, on Tuesdays and Fridays, we do bench press with shoulder presses on, on those days. That means that those eight, seven, fives here are done on Thursdays and these are done on Mondays. That's the only difference. Still, a lot of repetitions. And you see, we go up to 10 repetitions. We never go more than five repetitions in Olympic weightlifting because if we do, <coughs> the bar is way too slow. But what is this period here? November, December, hypertrophy period. That means that the bar doesn't have to go very fast in powerlifting. You just have to do the work. And then people say, is this old fashioned? Yes, it is. But why do we do this? Why in the hell are we doing 10 repetitions in squats when we only need to do one? Because if we do one, we have the speed and power, right? If we do 10, we go much slower. If we work within this percent, why are we doing this? It's one of the secrets. And if I tell it to everybody, it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> why are we doing it? It's like putting the money in the bank <coughs> and getting it out with interest rate later on. If you don't put any money in the bank, you have nothing to take out. It's super compensation curve, okay? You train hard, you go down, you rest, you regulate the volume and intensity, and you perform. That's just theory, and we are doing that here. Then if we are doing it in the right order, I don't care, it works for us. Some people do it in another order. I do it in this order because it keeps us out of injuries. Gerd Cantor has had one injury in seven years. That is the success story. One injury in seven years. I'm extremely proud of that because usually when my athletes injure themselves, I feel awful because it's my responsibility. I've done something wrong. <coughs> Maybe they're unlucky and they step on a, some, some curve or something and twist their ankle. That's maybe unluck. But 90% of the time, they are doing something wrong at the wrong time. And we coaches, we are too bad on taking the responsibility for that. I take full responsibility for that when my people do work bad and when my people hurt themselves. It's my responsibility for 90% of the time. Get Cantor is an awful javelin thrower and he's an awful hammer thrower. He throws 30 meters in hammer and 40 meters in javelin. He cannot do anything but throw discs. <laughs> that means that he is extremely specifically trained for throwing discs. He used to be a decent basketball player. He can't do anything. He can't high jump. He jumps five meters in long jump. I mean, I can jump six. <laughs> I'm not talking bad about him. It's just a fact. But the thing is, that we are, we are good on doing the stuff that works for discus, Ex extremely good. And the good thing about it is that 
we have been able to stay out of injuries. Because during my career, and I threw discus for 30 years because I started to throw when I was six and I stopped when I was 36. I hurt myself four times during my career throwing the discus. Usually the injuries come from running sprints, doing boundings and lifting weights. And why do we hurt ourselves lifting weights? Because we are not following the program <coughs> and the program is too hard. In our world, it doesn't exist that you lift and then you see how you're gonna feel after three months. The secret of our system is I calculated out one year in advance and then I adjust it during the time and I put extremely much time on that to calculate it out so we don't go over the border. And then if we take the theoretical part, put it into experience and common sense and we stay always, if there is any whatsoever risk that we are taking, we take always one step back. That's just a rule when it comes to lifting. If there is any weakness in the back area or he's a little stiff in the pectoralis today or something, we go down five kilos, we adjust it, we, it's common sense. We still do the repetitions like s says there. The repetitions through the years have pretty much been the same. I adjust the intensity a little bit comparing to the situation. Okay. Any questions about this? <coughs> when it comes to the exercises, it's squats, front squats, bench press, incline bench press, press deadlift, sumo deadlift, and the periodization is like this, and the uh, rest and goal strength and hypertrophy done all year except in general preparation. Yeah. We need a pause, two minutes. Any questions? The deadlift is in here, but we have, yeah, but we have back muscles and there is a lot of times throwers that have back problems, a lot of times. And we have had back problems too. And there is no coincidence that the back problem came because the weakest part of Jeff Cantor is the lower back. And that's a reason that He's born with a with problem in the low back, some, some nerve system that is wrong from birth. So he's kind of unlucky there, but like all the people that I've worked with, I put a lot of pressure on doing pulls and deadlift just to strengthen the back of the thighs up to the bottom and up to the lower back because it's really hard to throw 10 to 12,000 throws a year with a weak back. And that is very much connected to the abdominals. So we do a lot of stabilization and we do a lot of twisting work and specific work, but it's mostly related to throwing. We do not a lot of twists with bars like Don was talking about. We did it in the past. Why? Because I'm spending my theory with Get Canted today on the guys that have thrown over 66 meters is to spend as much time on exactly the specifics that we need to do to throw 70 meters or 75 meters. So all the energy goes into the main lifts, getting prepared with warming up and taking care of that part, stretching and doing functional stability and this kind of stuff before and after each session. We spend one hour a day doing that. <coughs> that is all general stuff that you know about. We don't do anything different than anybody else when it comes to that. We just put a lot of time into it. Then we train really the things that are most important. We throw discus and we lift heavy weights. And we lift them within the percent that we know that works from a theoretical point of view and from our experience. Uh, when it comes to general things of all kinds of twisting exercise, I put it all into throwing. It's all done with medicine balls on Wednesdays and Saturdays and you can also see that on the sheets that you get this morning if you read it through when you come home it's all done by throwing so all specific work is done with throwing 
throwing 10 feet tool, throwing three kilo balls, throwing medicine balls. So <coughs> when it comes to throwing six times a week, sometimes what we do in, in, in the middle of the winter, two of those throws is with medicine balls. So all specific work is done with medicine balls and that is our specific strength. And then stabilization with all kinds of rotational work. Any more questions on power lifting? Yeah. Along with what you were just saying, you mentioned a moment ago squats. Do you do things like uh, kettle balls or, or dumbbells to do the unstable type of movements? More, more aimed to, to show. Can, can you repeat it? Like, you know the kettle balls, like yeah. the metal weighted ends and stuff yeah. that you've done. No. Like no. Like no. no. I'm not very much into alternatives. Uh, I think people have gotten away from what is important. I think it's too much when people start to do bench press laying on a Swiss ball with the legs on a medicine ball. <laughs> people are doing this and it's fine when it comes to stabilization. Do stabilization for 20 minutes a day, that's fine. We used to fight and we got the stabilization like that in the early days. Now people are sitting in front of the computer and then they use the rest of the time SMSing to people. And that's, we are just not as active as before and because of that stabilization has come in as a big part. But if you're doing a chest exercise, do regular bench press, dumbbell presses and stuff like that without laying on the Swiss ball. Because the Swiss ball is good, but it's not gonna come instead of the bench press and absolutely not instead of the squats. I call it performance strength and then I call the other stuff general strength. Don't get away with just because it's new and it's actually good because the machines are getting out of the gyms and the Swiss ball is coming instead and all kinds of good uh, stabilization exercise. I really like it, but it's not gonna come instead of squats and bench press. It's not, never, okay? When you say medicine balls, does that include D balls? D balls, yeah. what's that? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, we do that all the time. We call it power ball. Uh, we throw the power ball discus wise and we throw the power ball with different exercises. <coughs> and then we throw in November and December general medicine ball exercises. Even shot related, javelin related. Then when it comes to throwing, I'm always trying to get as much throws in as possible. So all the specific strength is done by throwing. And that is just to understand that I'm trying to get <coughs> as much throwing in the body as possible. Because I believe in more you, the more you throw, <coughs> the faster and better discus throw you're gonna be. So I'm kind of, kind of squeezing in as much throwing as possible on medicine balls in November and December. So they are actually throwing six times a week in November and December, but two of those sessions are with medicine balls. It's just the way we do it. I never get too much away from the event. We take what I've talked about. We take stabilization and abs and this kind of stuff that we always do every day in the warm up. We do Olympic weightlifting that is snatch, cleans and pulls and push presses and jerks. And then we do squats, deadlifts and bench presses and incline bench presses, sumo deadlifts and, and uh, front squats. That is the main issue. There's actually six exercises that are the most important exercise. It's the cleans, snatches, push presses, and it's the squats, front squats, and deadlifts. That's the basic throwing exercises, and that's nothing new. A lot of people are not doing deadlifts. Do deadlifts. Like when we do deadlifts, we do maybe three sets of clean pulls, because clean pulls, you're holding the same way as you do in deadlift. You just turn around the one arm like that when you do deadlifts. So let's say we take a typical throwing, you know, li lifting session for get <coughs> with a deadlift. Then we do <coughs> pulls. He starts on 100 kilos and just does warm ups. And his first set on the clean pulls is he's going to do five, set, five sets <coughs> or three sets of clean pulls. And the first is 160 kilos for five. 170 kilos for five, 180 kilos for five. Then he does two sets of deadlift, right? And just that, does that on 200 kilos and 210 kilos. Then we do 
five sets of clean pulls and deadlifts together, we get overload on the back. So when we start to clean in Jan January, 160 in cleans is very easy on the back, okay? It's an overload principle and we know that from the training theory books. <coughs> small exercises. These are the small exercises we do. I'm gonna start with the legs. We do stiff leg deadlift for the back of the exercise. We do calf raises, adduction, leg extension, and leg curl. We do this twice a week all year around. Has nothing specifically to do with explosion or anything, and because of that, it can be done in a lazy way. It can, it's fine. I usually put on Mondays, I put in, the program is like this, snatch pulls, five sets. Let's say we are now in, just like now on Monday, we're gonna do snatch pulls, five sets, five reps on 160 to 170 kilos. Then he's gonna do back squats uh, between five and 10 reps, five sets on uh, around uh, 180 to 220 kilos. Then he's done with his one Olympic lift and one power lift. Then he does calf raises and stiff leg deadlift. Two of those exercises for the legs, you know? Then if we go down to uh, Thursday, same muscle groups. We do clean pulls instead of snatch pulls. We do front squats instead of back squats. And we do uh, adduction and leg curl. Okay, very simple. Two, one exercise Olympic lifting, one exercise power lifting, two exercises what I call small exercises that are auxiliary exercises for symmetry in the body that is actually bodybuilding. It's not too much of neuromuscular exercise. They are not explosive. They are just to keep symmetry in the body. We do it every single week, pretty much all year around except we take it down to one exercise during the competition season, okay? Back, like I said before, we do hyperextensions, good mornings, kicks back, spent over row and lat pull, and that is the same thing. We put one exercise or two in on, on those days where we are working the back, and, uh, and these are the exercises, and that's about it. Small exercises when it comes to chest are very few because we are doing bench press and we are doing incline bends. Then we do little flat bench dumbbells and we do that in relation to the bench press. When we do bench press today, like on Tuesday, we are gonna do bench press. Then he does five sets of five to 10 repetitions like I've been talking to, talking about, and he's working right now on 160 to 170 kilos. Uh, he's gonna be working there then he does bench press, then he goes and does inclined dumbbell presses. When he's done with inclined dumbbell presses, he goes and does shoulders, military press, and maybe a dumbbell press. So it's the same thing there, one to two powerlifting exercises, plus two to three small exercises that are related to the shoulder. It's just a little bit more load, a little bit more stabilization on the shoulders and chest, and specific specificity and symmetry in the body. Shoulders are military press, incline dumbbell press, upright row, bent over laterals and press behind the neck. And I try to have those exercises and vary them through the year so he's not always doing the same thing. But this is the lazy part of our program. Abs, no, uh, arms, very little emphasis on this, but I don't take any muscle group and leave it out. I actually never write this in the program. I hate bicep curls <laughs> uh, because it's very over-related and uh, we are not using that very much, but we do it like uh, mostly in the winter time and very little and not at all in the summer. We do uh, a lot of tricep work when it comes to the bench presses stuff because it's included in the tricep, but during <coughs> the pumping period, maintenance periods and the uh, and the hypertrophy period, we actually work the arms also. But the bigger arms a thrower gets, 
in discourse, the worse it is really, because it's in the way. I don't want discourse throwers to have big arms. Apps, uh, Gert has through the years gotten more into this, and that's because I have a full-time physio that is working with me every day. He's a full-time physio just for Gert Cantor, and uh, he takes care of this part of the train, and he's much better on that than me. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have a guy like that. He's a young guy from Estonia that learned everything from Alekna's physio, that is one of the best in the world, because he was physio for Alexander Tam Tamert as it's a training partner to Alekna for three years before he came to us. We do sit-ups, leg lifts, rotational twists, dives, and like a program, and we're going to show you a little bit of a regular program that he's doing in the warm-up for the session tomorrow. Okay? Dives. <laughs> I didn't have any words for it. It's why, like when you are diving forward even in a cable cross machine, or if you're on, on your knees and you have like a, a cable, and you go forward, I just call it dives. It's called the rolled crunches also. But it's like, it's about twists and rotations for the rotational muscles. It's about lifting the legs and it's about the sit-ups also. So we try to do just a lot of variation on this. Uh, in the old days, we only did sit-ups. This is just more variation today and that's good. Uh, training methods are always three sets. We never do more than three sets on each exercise, but we can do up to 10 exercises uh, that are mostly just done because in, in, in this area, we have a lot of slow muscle fibers. We can actually do a lot of repetition in this area, and that's fine. Uh, reps are uh, a lot of times between uh, 6 and 12 on the regular sex exercises, except the abs. Uh, tempo is slow. Uh, intensity is medium. You don't have to kill yourself doing those exercises. You just have to do the reps. Rest is 1 to 2 minutes. Goals is symmetry, injury prevention, and specificity and you do this all year around. Periodization is very simple. We do it all year, but we vary the repetitions a little bit. We do it mostly in October with a lot of reps, and then it goes down here. And during camps, we actually go a little bit heavier on those exercises, but you can see that we are never down to one or three reps here. Like when we do like uh, dumbbell presses and stuff like that, we're always pumping. And we are doing that to keep the volume in the body. As I said before, you're going to get paid for that later if you keep certain volume in the body because we're doing a lot of volume in hypertrophy period and in maintenance period. And then we lose the volume when we are on training camps because we are doing a lot of one, two, threes. But by doing this on a sub-maximal uh, intensity, we keep the volume in the body and we are working with very big guys and they have to have volume in the body. Otherwise, they lose feeling and they lose... Uh, believe in themselves. It's very different from jumpers and, and runners. Runners and jumpers, they don't understand this. And I, I really understand that because it's really far away from running and jumping. It's all about relative strength in running <coughs> and jumping. Here it's about relative strength in a certain way, but it's always also about maximum strength for a very big body. And the biggest mental problem that uh, throwers have, they feel they are too small. They feel they are too small, and they are maybe 135 kilos, and everybody else thinks they are monsters. And they look in the mirror, what has happened to me? <laughs> Do I have AIDS? You know, <laughs> because uh, <coughs> it actually happened to me too. When I was the biggest, I was 127 kilos, and I felt, shit, man, I am so small. I'm 27 kilos lighter now. And, and like, I didn't realize until, until after my career when I saw pictures of me with a group of other people what a monster I was. And this is actually a big mental problem for throwers. We always feel so small. And what are we going to do? We have to feel big. We have to have the tone in the muscles. We have to have the filling in the genes. It, it's actually a big mental thing. And one of the absolute biggest reasons for that people do bad, they feel too small and they feel too weak. 
So what are we going to do about it? We have to be smart. We can't say you're stupid because you're not. I've been there myself. It's a terrible feeling. When you see another phone, oh, he looks so big. <laughs> and you're maybe 10 kilos heavier. Yourself. It's a picture of yourself that is not the same as other people see you. And because of that, we have to be smart and work with that and turn that mental process into something positive. And how can we do that? By being very smart on periodizing this part of the training and keeping the volume in that, even though we are taking the volume down for maybe three to six weeks in the powerlifting and in the Olympic weightlifting, and that is going to reduce the weight of the thrower in a positive way. They're going to throw much further because they are two or three kilos, kilos lighter. They are because they are faster relative strength. But we keep the volume in the body by cruising in the weight room on those exercises. We cruise. We go in the weight room twice a week and we cruise. We do the bodybuilding so it keeps the volume, it keeps the tone. <coughs> Questions? We have four minutes. When HP you start throwing, and if, if it's coming over the age of 15, what sort of training did you do beforehand? Gert. Yeah. He didn't do any lifting, serious lifting, until he w met me, really. 21. So and I can give you... Yeah. Huh? That's when he started throwing discus. No, he started throwing discus when he was 16, 17, but he never did that seriously until he met me. And uh, he was a basketball player. So he actually started pretty late, and he didn't really know what the hell he was doing in the weight room. But uh, today he has done 209 kilos in bench press for one. He has done uh, 172 kilos in the cleans. He's a terrible snatcher. He's only done 117 kilos. Uh, he has done 260 in back squats for three, and 230 in front squats for one. And uh, that's just a regular strength. Uh, he's a terrible deadlifter. Uh, push press 150 for three. So nothing spectacular. His absolutely best lift is front squats. Very good positions, and he has very strong legs, even though we are not pushing it. If I would push him and kill him and say, come on there and kill yourself, he would probably be able to do 290 kilos in squats, and that's pretty good for a guy that is 196 tall. But I know a lot of guys that are much stronger. I was stronger myself. So it's nothing spectacular in the weight room, but we have managed since uh, 2001 to go from 56 meters to 73 meters in seven years. And he is the guy that has gone, one of the guys at least, that has gone mostly f forward for the last few years in, uh, in discus in the world. And the reason from weightlifting point of view or strength training point of view is that the slowest process gives the fastest results. That's my philosophy. What does that mean? Go slowly forward in the weightlifting, and it gives actually the fastest results because we don't get any injuries. The slowest process gives the fastest results. So every time he asks me if he can go heavier, 99% of the time I say no. So he stopped asking. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? No, push press is, is like a jerk, is like that. Push press is just where, when you push just up. Boom, like that. Very much related to, to throwing and extremely related to shot put. We do that mostly because he likes it. Uh, and it's actually related to the release of the throw. And it's an explosive exercise. More questions? Serious weightlifting shouldn't be done until the people are grown up, and <coughs> that depends on when you're grown up. Uh, you can start doing weightlifting when they are 15, and you can actually teach them from birth, because we think it's okay that our kid that is three years old goes up here and jumps down. 
that's much more pressure than putting a stick on their, on their back and do squats. But we think something is wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't put pressure on the spine until they are 15, 16, 50% 50 of max. And you, I usually have like a working ethic that 17 to 18 years of age, we can start to push a little pressure when it comes to periodization. No periodization between 15 and 16, 17 to 18, we start, can start to put more seriousness in it. After 18 years of age, we can actually lift pretty heavy. Common sense, everybody is different. More questions? In all the countries you go to, what's the television coverage? Because it is countries like that. <laughs> <laughs> the mean, television so coverage? Frank Gage on the World Championship, I think he used to show one show or two shows. Oh. Yeah, I have to say, uh, comparing to the 80s, I, I felt very happy when Kev Cantor won the world championships this year because he's the only world champion from Estonia in any sport. That means that right now he is the biggest athlete in Estonia. And it is really fun to go there. <laughs> uh, I felt like that in the 80s in Iceland because we had seven throwers that qualified to the Tokyo World Championships in 1991. We had seven throwers in small Iceland. I was one of them. And we felt like huge, you know. Now it's only soccer and too bad. But, but Estonia is actually a discus country. And it's because of Gerd Kanter, Alexander Tamert, Mert Israel, and Marcus Hunt, the world junior record holder and world junior champion. And because of that, discus is actually huge in Estonia right now, and it's really fun. And the coverage is great. But when it comes to other countries, Sweden is actually pretty good. I live in Sweden. Denmark is awful. It's only soccer. And I know it used to be good here, but I guess uh, soccer has taken over like <laughs> everywhere else. More? OK. Then I think for myself today, and I see you tomorrow, those that are going to stay. And there are more athletes coming in tomorrow. So thanks for, for this. I'll be back.